Welcome to Stories of Scotland. This week, we are continuing with our Halloween journey. I am your local crypt dweller, Jenny. And I'm your gravestone enthusiast, Annie. And in this episode, we're talking about a place near and dear to my heart. It's the graveyard next door. Well, not quite next door. The graveyard is technically over the very busy road from our house, but that doesn't quite have the same ring to it, does it? (laughs) No, it certainly doesn't. But yes, this is one of the three graveyards that remain in the very centre of the city of Inverness, and it is by far my favourite. Bold claims. While the other two graveyards remain connected to churches on one of the main streets, this graveyard, called Chapel Yard Cemetery, sits alone and untethered from any place of worship, just on the outskirts of the town centre. Now, I became absolutely enthralled by this graveyard after learning that it was the burial place of one of my favourite Gaelic poets, Mary Vaur, Great Mary of the Songs. And I often bring her flowers. Well, her grave flowers. Oh, that's lovely, Annie. We walk by this graveyard almost every day, and while you are familiar with it and even have a grave to visit, I've never actually taken my wandering feet in. Whenever I'm passing by, I feel I never quite have the time to pop in and have a look around. But why, Jenny? It's a lovely little space of green Mm. with lots of trees and berries. Things that you really like. I do like trees and berries, but these ones are all hidden behind walls and hedges. And it's not just that, Annie. It's also because it's right next to the busiest roundabout in the city. <laughs> and I always have to, like, like gear myself up mentally before crossing it. It's like dodgems out there, Annie. Only I'm not in a dodgem and everyone else is in cars and I'm barefoot. Why barefoot, Jenny? I like to imagine that I'm in the Stone Age. You know, <laughs> take myself back to that primal state. The cars are all big cat predators trying to catch me and feed me to their small, smart car cubs. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I feel that mentality just helps me cross the road, you know? Okay, um, for anyone out there, please do not adopt the same mentality and shoes in the city centre are beneficial. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> <laughs> anyways, we're going to the graveyard, Jenny. So let's tie up your laces and look both ways before crossing. Yes, (laughs) Mum. As we walk to the cemetery, the noise of the road is so much that we have to shout at each other to be heard. There's squeaking brakes and lines of impatient cars stopping and starting, lorries and even that one brave cyclist. And just as it seems to be reaching a crescendo pitch... We turn left and we pass into the peace of Chapel Yard Cemetery. And it all just falls away. The cemetery is bounded by thick walls in some places and even thicker hedges in others. These work in tandem to provide handy insulation from the hectic outside world. As well as handy insulation from the greyness of the surrounding city. The cemetery is overwhelmingly green. Green grass, green mosses and lichens. And most of the trees are still on the green side of the autumnal cusp. But in between the shades of green are these tombstones, densely packed and stretching out under the shady canopy of trees. I actually found a description of the cemetery from my 1886 visitor's guide to Inverness and the neighbourhood. Oh yeah, it's just my handy guide from the 19th century. (laughs) (laughs) I have one for all the Highland towns. (laughs) Not the central belt. (laughs) Within the walls on our left is the Chapel Yard Burying Ground, where the curious in such matters will find many ancient tombs and gravestones, the majority, like those in whose memories they were erected, fast moulding away. The ground is said at one time to have belonged to a monastery of Dominican or Black Friars located in Inverness. And within it was one of the chapels which Cromwell demolished for the purpose of erecting his fort. Oh, Cromwell demolished so many chapels for the purpose of erecting that fort. Mm, Classic Cromwell. (laughs) So Cromwell was the Lord Protector of the Commonwealth of England, Scotland and Ireland. Oh, poor Wales. 
Oh, at the time Wales was part of England. Interesting. But we don't remember that time mm. because we all know Wales to be its own established country yeah. with its proudly devolved government as it is today. That's certainly how I think of Wales. <laughs> <laughs> I love Wales. I went to Aberystwyth <laughs> University. Uh, <laughs> My mum was born in Aberystwyth. <laughs> really? Yeah. They were on holiday. <laughs> A big shout out to anyone listening in Aberystwyth right now. Did I say that well? Aberystwyth. <laughs> you go. Aberystwyth. Oh, that's pretty good. You can tell you live there. <laughs> <laughs> Hard left when it came to Wales. <laughs> Cromwell was around in the mid-1600s and he was a really vicious leader. Mm. You can tell just from his attitude towards Wales being part of England. (laughs) Um, And he was, some might say, a bit of a massive dictator. And he heavily persecuted people of different denominations to him, especially Catholics. But he wasn't just bad to people, he was bad to buildings too. Yes, he was very bad. Real bad. Big baddie. He destroyed a lot of beautiful buildings to make his own strongholds. Cromwell stripped our lovely Tom Nehuvik Cemetery in Inverness of all of its trees for building materials and also took the stone from the monasteries of Kinloss and Bewley. He combined these with the stones from St Mary's Chapel in Inverness, which would have been here in Chapel Yard Cemetery but instead it became a citadel for Cromwell next to the river. So if there's one thing we know about Oliver Cromwell, it's that he really desecrated our historic architecture. He took the rich history of the chapel and destroyed it for his own means. There is evidence of the site being used for religious purposes as far back as 1116, when William the Lion gave the land to God in the Church of St Mary of Inverness. And, by 1371, walls had been built to enclose it, and a Dominican chapel was thriving, home to many austere black friars, monks who relied on the charity of local people and spread the gospel of St Dominic. Christianity was well established in Scotland by the medieval period, and monasteries like this would have been common in most major settlements of the time providing both food for the spirit and alcohol for the the soul. soul. (laughs) (laughs) That is until the Scottish Reformation of 1560, in which Presbyterian beliefs took precedence in law over the Catholic. After the Reformation, we know the lands of Chapel Yard Cemetery were converted into a glebe, and there's even a Glebe Street opposite our wee graveyard. A Glebe? That sounds like a sheep that has, like, long human hair instead of wool. <laughs> oh, this is horrifying, Jenny. You're not allowed to say things like that. It might be Halloween season, but not that spooky. You could braid it. Ugh. <laughs> no, a Glebe is simply a parcel of land that's used to support the parish priest. And at this point, Chapel Yard's only use transforms into a burial place. And then, a hundred years later, along comes Cromwell, here to steal your stone and your whiskey. He didn't last too long, though, and neither did his citadel. It was torn down by Highland chiefs in 1662. That's what happens when you're quite literally the Grinch who stole Christmas. (laughs) Well, enough Cromwell, back to Chapel Yard Cemetery. I say more glebes. (laughs) (laughs) Endless glebes. Now, the oldest gravestone still present at Chapel Yard is that of Hester Elliot, who died in 1604. And the more modern graves span right up until the mid-1900s. And it was from reading these gravestones that we came up with our episode on the Cabbage Patch Murder. The Cabbage Patch Murder of Inverness. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So... It is an experience when you're walking through the graveyard that you can just just feel that you're almost meeting these ghosts from the past. Mm, and it blows my mind that there's a thousand years of history just across the road from our house. This place is like the skeleton of Inverness. The bones of the history of the Highlands lie in the ground here. Which, actually now I say it, is a bit creepy. Well, mm. I mean, it's not metaphorical bones. There's literally bodies. <laughs> Jenny? We actually saw a few rabbits while we were in the cemetery and you got really excited 
because you were hoping that some bones might have been thrown up from their rabbit holes. I'm not excited about bones. You were excited. <laughs> I always look in rabbit holes when I'm in a cemetery because if I see a bone, then I report it to the local archaeological authority. tourists are visiting Inverness, I would advise them to just pop into this graveyard. It's only a three-minute walk from our favourite second-hand bookshop in the whole world, which is, of course, Leakey's Bookshop here mm. in Inverness. And there's some incredible 300 or 400-year-old carvings just dabbled onto the high walls of the cemetery. There's multiple skulls and crossbones. Yarmy parties. There's angels and cherubs. Oh! And there's some thistles. Yum. <laughs> what what noise do you associate with a thistle? Ow, that's prickly. <laughs> oh hi, the new. <laughs> oh look at me, I'm a wee thistle in a graveyard. A graveyard is a thousand stories under stones. We have the fragile lives of people buried in this place. This place full of brambles and under a broad canopy of trees. It's a place of memorial and it can tell us stories of everyday people and lives of the past that we might never otherwise know of. What I found fascinating about so many of the gravestones is that they had the professions of the deceased on them and they paint this wonderful picture of the workings of the city through the last few centuries. Yes, so we just jotted down a couple of the professions that we saw. Shall we do a quick fire test, Jenny? Yes, let's see how many I can get. Okay, tailor. Uh, makes clothes. Carpenter. Um, uh, builds things out of wood. Mason. Uh, stone maker man or secret cult. <laughs> <laughs> meal dealer. Uh, the guy that stands behind the counter at Tesco when you're getting your meal deal. Oh no. <laughs> no, Jenny. A um, meal dealer is a person who deals meal, which is a cereal that's been roughly ground. Think oatmeal or cornmeal. Could you make bread from it? You could make a meal from it. I was, <laughs> I was going to say you could have a sandwich, which is essentially the same as what I said. <laughs> <laughs> okay, provost. Uh, important city person? I don't actually know what a provost does. A provost is a Scots version of a mayor, essentially. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. It's a dignitary title. It's one of those ones you hear all the time, but I've never actually been like, what does a provost do? I just know that they have like keys around the necks. My mum used to be the provost of Nairn. No. Yeah. <laughs> she got a gold chain. That's what I mean, right? <laughs> they got the bling, the provost. <laughs> um, Flesher. Uh, ooh, uh, someone who skins animals? Now, it can be someone who skins animals elsewhere in the UK, but in Scotland, weirdly, a flesher is often used as a butcher. Interesting. Okay, cool. A uh, commission agent. Hmm. Someone who pays you to make art. <laughs> no, just think of someone who sells Avon. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Your great 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 granddad sells Avon. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a person who makes money through selling things okay. and making commission on their money. Got it. Um, a fishing tackle master. I uh, know. A... <laughs> you don't I'm need sorry. A... <laughs> a fishing tackle maker. Someone who's really good at tackling fish out the water. <laughs> So they just make the, the <laughs> tackle to attract the fish. Technically, again, the same thing. So a dyer. Uh, someone that if you want to um, fake your own death and just skip <laughs> town, you employ this person to be that fake dead body of you while you run away from all your responsibilities. No, Jenny. Mm. A dyer is just someone who's dyeing textiles. That sounds like a dyer profession. <laughs> <Aye>. <laughs> <laughs> But what is noteworthy about all these different professions is that they're all the profession of men. Often on the gravestones, their wives were buried in the same plots. The women are noted as beloved wives and dutiful mothers. But other than that, there's no real information to gather about any of the women in the graveyard. 
Except my beloved Gaelic poet. Who is just hundreds of flowers all by Annie, (laughs) just all around her. And a couple rabbit bones. (laughs) But yes, what you're saying here is kind of a testament to how society used to be structured really before the 20th century. So we imagine that men were the kind of sole breadwinners, as we think of them, often working in labour outside of the home whilst women would be doing the unpaid domestic labour inside the home, raising children, keeping the house, and so on. But this paints a very sweeping two-dimensional view of Victorian life for women, and actually quite an inaccurate one, Mm. because women also did wage-paying work outside of the house, in textile and fabric factories, in domestic services such as cleaning or cooking, Um, sewing as a professional seamstress or even brewing alcohol. In with the monks. However, the difference between a Victorian man's work and a Victorian woman's work... Ooh, is it the gender pay gap? The stained glass ceiling? (laughs) Yes, it is, actually. Victorian... (laughs) Victorian women were paid so much significantly less than the men Mm. that the reason that men do not want women to be working was because they'd be driving down the the wage Ah, for them. Okay. But there was also this perception in Victorian society that the woman's employment was not central to her identity. And so for these engravings upon the gravestones... They are remembered as either wives or mothers because that's how their identity was centred at that time. But that's certainly not all that they did. And there's significant historical evidence showing us this. However, one of the gravestones that interested us because it didn't mention either motherhood or marriage was that of Margaret McFarlane. And the only reason it drew our attention, really, is because we didn't know what the final sentence on her gravestone meant. Margaret McFarlane, sister-in-law of Reverend James Kennedy, born at Rednock, 1782, died in Inverness, June 2nd, 1862. Succorer to many. And what does it mean, Jenny, to be a succorer to many? After quick investigation... I found out that it means that Margaret was someone who helps others in times of need and difficulty. And it wasn't just once or twice. No, this was such a noteworthy part of her life and character that it was the final words that she is forever remembered by. And isn't that lovely, Annie? That is lovely. What would you like to be forever remembered by, Jenny? What do you want on your gravestone? Mm, Here lies Jenny. (laughs) <laughs> and, and how do I spell that, Jenny? Just just for the little notepad here. Uh, I'm going to have an interactive tombstone, actually, with like a, like a button on it, like the voice. And when you hit it, the graveyard spins around um, and then a dolphin jumps out from a pond behind and gives the, gives the noise. <laughs> but the dolphin has my head on it. <laughs> and my feet as well. <laughs> for the benefit of the listener, my face is looking at Jenny in disgust. You look like one of the little gargoyles carved in the walls. (laughs) (laughs) So let's go back to Margaret McFarlane. (laughs) Succorer to many in Victorian Scotland. This could mean many things. She could have helped people who faced poverty, sickness or disease. I've done a little bit of research on Margaret and I find that she was born in the port of Menteith, which is just on the cusp of Loch Lomond and the Trossachs National Park. Ah, Port of Menteith. I once got into this weird, deep research hole about the Lake of Menteith, which is supposedly the only lake in Scotland, because, of course, every other body of water in Scotland is known as a loch, and no one really knows why it's a lake. Some think it's because there was a monastery on one of the islands in the loch. Others believe it's because there was a Dutch map produced that had it down as a lake, and everyone just sort of went along with this one Dutch map. (laughs) <laughs> and how did you get out of this watery research hole, Jenny? Um, turns out it's not actually that deep, as there's technically other lakes in Scotland, and the lake is also called Loch Inchmahome, so it is a loch. It's just got two names. <laughs> we were going to do a whole episode on this, just me talking about Dutch map makers. <laughs> anyway, Jenny, it's a splendid part of the world, 
And when Margaret was born, Radnock would have just been a small settlement, really just a scattering of houses. It would have been a quiet and serene rural life. The particular area where Margaret was born is a delightful mixture of farmlands. It's a place overlooked by mountains, close to lochs... And lakes. ...and plentiful forests. So Margaret had five brothers and one sister. Okay. And one of the threads that I followed to find out more about her is actually through her brother-in-law. Ah, yes, the Reverend. He was on her gravestone, which also struck me as a bit odd because it didn't have her husband or children or parents. It was her brother-in-law. Well, I'm guessing it's because he was the one who paid for the gravestone Mm. and would be mourning her. And I wasn't able to find out any um, marriage certificate, so... I don't think she had a husband. Mm. I looked them up on the census of 1861 and Margaret lived with her sister Jean and her sister's husband, who was the Reverend James Kennedy. They stayed at number one Huntley Place in Inverness, which is a brilliant location overlooking our beautiful River Ness. Fancy. Rev James and Margaret had a daughter named Elizabeth, a boarder also named Elizabeth, (laughs) And a servant called Grace. (laughs) (laughs) And a servant named Grace. Ah, quite the busy household. I've looked up Reverend James Kennedy in some of the local newspapers and he was quite an advocate for developing schools for children in impoverished areas of Invernessshire and trying to give children the best chance to have an education. So it wouldn't surprise me if Margaret was described as a succorer because she helped with this, supporting children in learning, reading, writing and arithmetic. Otherwise, she might have helped her brother in the church, because that's another way the Victorians would perceive themselves in saving souls. Or it could have been a combination of these things. Ah, well, it was lovely to see your gravestone and learn a little bit more about the woman of Inverness. While I was researching this graveyard, I came across some strange inhabitants of the graveyard. Is it more fairies? I absolutely love fairies, and fairies love graveyards. Ah, alas no, we covered a lot of that in our Tom Nahurik episode, and there's so many fairies there that it's clearly the central hub for fairies in Inverness, and this graveyard is in fact home to a much more sinister inhabitant. Oh. Tell me, Annie, what is 21 inches long? But hard to tie in a knot. And a cow's tail. No, Annie. Although maybe possibly, yes, that could be another answer to this one. But the inhabitant of this graveyard is a massive snake. Annie, <laughs> in 1860, a 21 inch long snake was found in the cemetery. <laughs> That's 53 centimetres. That's right? not that massive, That's... Jenny. <laughs> That's not that massive at all. Oh yeah, because I'm thinking of like a, I was honestly I was thinking of a meter stick, but now I'm picturing it with my hands. I'm thinking of a thirty centimeter ruler, and it's just a bit longer than that. But stick with me. It's right? almost two thirty centimeter, <laughs> which is still pretty short, actually. And I know we have some Australian listeners down under who will scoff at that, but this is a whopper of a snake for Scotland. We only have one native type of snake, and it's the secretive venomous adder. So it was probably a big one of these that had sneakily slithered in from the neighbouring timber yard. And what happened to this adventurous snake? Well, it was such a beast. It made side article news in multiple local newspapers. Some even hypothesised it was the Loch Ness monster herself. (laughs) Because everyone knows that Nessie is 21 inches. (laughs) Well, people always get lionised after (laughs) Well, Annie, they took this snake and they made it provost of Inverness. <laughs> really? No, no, they killed it. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it was in multiple newspapers. It was a big day when they found this medium-sized snake. Well, Jenny, I have some local newspaper knowledge for you, too. Oh, what's it going to be? <laughs> a 22-inch long snake? <laughs> don't, don't be silly, Jenny. We don't get snakes that big. <laughs> So, Jenny, why would a couple of hundred people with wonderful singing voices gather in Chapel Yard Cemetery in the mid-1800s? They were doing the Harlem Shake. No, Jenny. (laughs) This was pre-Harlem Shake. No, no, no. Yeah, Harlem Shake, that's right. Is that where everyone gets in a group and dances? Yes. Okay, sorry. 
<laughs> it was the overspill from the Gallic church. So sermons would be given in Chapel Yard Cemetery itself amongst the gravestones. Aww. And I find this strangely comforting that the graveyard itself was also used as a place of worship even centuries after its chapel had been destroyed. A few of the stones are in quite a state of disrepair. There were some that had fallen, others had decorative urns lying next to them rather than sitting on top of them, and some of them looked like vandals had been busy at work. And these aren't the only stones to have been deliberately destroyed in the graveyard. Um, there's a story that goes way back to Culloden, and I found this wonderful quote of this pre-Culloden knight um, in the Mackenzie's Guide to Inverness and the Highlands from 1897, because I apparently love late 1800s Inverness guidebooks. That's at least your second one. <laughs> <laughs> there are still many ancient and curious tombs and gravestones in Chapel Yard, although several, beautifully sculpted and of great interest, were destroyed by the followers of Prince Charlie in 1746 after they blew up the castle, because the owners refused to join and follow them to Dromossi Moor. After the Battle of Culloden, this god's acre was used by Cumberland as a fold for cattle, taken in from Lord Lovett's estates, which were fortified on account of his lordship's support of Prince Charles. So to damage a gravestone is obviously a sign of disrespect, because ancestry is so intrinsic to clan identity. There's a deep sense of pride and connection to those who have passed away, both recently and in ancient times. In old clan systems, each chief would appoint a bard who would recite the stories of the ancestors. And this was their clan history. It was their history podcast. Indeed, except it was all remembered orally and not listened to through headphones. That is slightly more impressive, you're right. <laughs> and as the gravestones are the physical marker of a person's memory in the world... They are seen as threads that tie people to their ancestors. When the Jacobites deliberately went into the graveyard and destroyed the gravestones of the families who had chosen not to support Bonnie Prince Charles, they were sending a strong message, not just to the living, but also to the dead. Your ancestors have no home here, and neither do you. We don't know if the Jacobites really destroyed the gravestones or if their enemies just wanted to put out some bad press about them to try to reduce public support of the Jacobite cause. But then the government army, after winning at Culloden, used Chapel Yard Cemetery to keep the cows of Lord Lovett. Now, Lord Lovett had been a Jacobite who had been at Culloden, and when the Jacobites lost at Culloden, all of their leaders had their lands confiscated and their assets confiscated. And amongst these assets, we see Lord Lovett's cows. What do you do with a herd of cows, Annie? Apparently, put them in Chapel Yard Cemetery. Oh. But it's a beautiful cemetery and I can't imagine a big herd of cows wandering in amongst the ruins of the chapel and the ancient graves. So... For both the Jacobites and the government troops, they seem to have a bit of disrespect in um, Chapel Yard Cemetery. Yes, honey, there was maybe some sour milk between the Jacobites and the government troops. Chapel Yard Cemetery is a wee crack of ancient Inverness in the modern city centre. So much history is packed into this serene little spot. From the Christian Chapel to the Reformation, from Cromwell to the Jacobite uprisings, and now into the modern day. It's been around since the very early development of Inverness as a settlement, and it holds so many stories between its walls, and also a snake or two. <laughs> It's especially lovely in springtime when we have these stunning pink and white cherry blossoms falling down from the trees. And that's the graveyard next door. 
If you're enjoying our podcast, then please take two minutes to give us a five-star rating and leave us a wee review on whatever platform you listen on. It makes our podcast so much easier for other people to find and for us to keep sharing our love of Scottish heritage. If you like what we say on here, then you'll also like what we say and post on our Facebook, Instagram and Twitter accounts. We love old photos of Scotland's past and creepy, creepy old shriveled turnips. <laughs> <laughs> the turnips have been giving me nightmares. They've been giving a lot of people nightmares. Got a lot of traction online. We carved some traditional turnips for uh, for Halloween last year and Annie secretly kept them drying out in a box in the attic for a year and then brought them downstairs last night and just scared the living daylights out of me with them. <laughs> and then she lit candles in them and the whole house smelt like turnips. <laughs> The ghost of turnips past haunting us. <laughs> so if you want to see these demon neeps, head over to our social media and give us a follow, a like and a share. And as well, an absolutely massive thank you from the bottom of our hearts to everyone who supports us on Patreon. We have a few new people joining our little Patreon family. Dee Dee, Jessica, Odin, Simon and Sarah. Thank you so much, you wonderful people, helping us share these surreal stories with the world. If you'd like to support us as well while we make this podcast, then you can go to www.patreon.com slash stories of Scotland and sign up. We really appreciate all of the support, whether it's through reviews, Patreon, or just liking and sharing our stuff on social media. Thank you all so much. Slangeva. Slangeva. Slangeva.